it's funny when I was uh, I was actually around five years old. I, I knew I was here for a reason. I just didn't know what it was, and uh, it only took me about fifty years to get engaged. But but the the real story is I was uh, born into a very sickly family, a lot of uh, illness. That's really what the book is about: is to begin to uh, describe the 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 primacy and the supremacy of copper metabolism, because that's really who our innate healer is. And people don't know about that, and, and everyone recognizes a, a, a copper battery, right? What people don't know is that this is what runs our mitochondria. Mm -hmm. This is what runs so many enzymes, and it's like, and when it's missing, that's when the symptoms appear. And, and again, it's just, it, it's like, come on, it's gotta be more complicated than that. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> It's, it's absolutely amazing. So I'm sure we'll get into a lot of that, but it was really a, um, a process of discovery where for the last almost 12 years now. Morley Robbins, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you, Ben. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I'm looking forward to our time together. And um, I, I love dancing on lines, and I think this is going to be a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. As soon as you got on my calendar for this interview, I, I got the the geek inside of me started to freak out <laughs> in a good way because yeah. I read your book courtesy of uh, Martha Carlin, who, who oh, linked yeah. us together. So, uh, so shout out to her. Yeah. And then I deep, took a deep dive into this amazing book called Cure Your Fatigue, How Balancing Three Minerals and One Protein is the Solution That You're Looking For. And I love studying new things about the mitochondria. And boy, oh boy. That I learned so much about copper, uh, so, uh, ceruloprotein, ceruloplasma, which is probably yeah. words that there, people are hearing for the first time. Yeah, so sure. I can't wait to dive into that. So before we do, though, let's go back to your story. Uh, how did you even get involved and become obsessed with copper and the mitochondria? That's a great question. You know, it, it's funny. When I was, uh, I was actually around five years old. I, I knew I was here for a reason. I just didn't know what it was. And uh, it only took me about 50 years to get engaged. But but the, the real story is I was uh, born into a very sickly family, a lot of uh, illness. Um, and my sister, my older sister, four years older, became a nurse. So I was supposed to become the doctor. So I went to school, went into pre-med. And it's like I was not cut out to... Uh, and put in those kind of hours. So I affectionately refer to myself as a pre-med retread. But um, if you can't become a doctor, then the most natural thing to do is become a hospital executive because mm. then you can boss them around, right? <laughs> so I did that for 12 years. I went to business school, became a hospital uh, exec. I never ran a hospital, didn't want to run the hospital. That's, that's an untenable job. But I was always on the uh, business planning, <clears throat> marketing, this, you know, growth of the organization side and did that for a number of years. And then I went into consulting, uh, management consulting for 20 years where I was wow. pulling a, a suitcase behind my back, <clears throat> running from one plane to another, not, not knowing what stress was like I do now. And my, my shoulder froze up. I couldn't pick my hand up above my waist. And <clears throat> everyone knows the story of me going to to a health food store and they told me to go see Dr. Liz. And I went, ah, I don't do witchcraft. And, <laughs> and then I finally woke up and went to see Dr. Liz. And she introduced me to a term I'd never heard in 32 years of working in the hospital field, which was the innate healer. And I was like, I said to myself, well, why do we have millions of doctors if there's an innate healer? So I really set out to identify who this was. And that's really what the book is about is to, begin to uh, describe the, the, the primacy and the supremacy of copper metabolism, because that's really who our innate healer is. And people don't know about that. And, and everyone recognizes a, a, a copper battery, right? We know, it, you know it's a copper, copper top battery, right? And so what people don't know is that this is what runs our mitochondria. Mm -hmm. This is what runs so many enzymes. And it's like, and when it's missing, that's when the symptoms appear. And, and again, it's just, it, it's like, come on, it's gotta be more complicated than that. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's, a, it's absolutely amazing. So I'm sure we'll get into a lot of that, but it was really a, um, a process of discovery where for the last almost 12 years now, uh, I get up and read for two to three hours a day. Like today, give you an example, today, 
started at um, it's like 5.45. And I've, I knew about uh, Paul A. Sharp at the uh, uh, King's College in London. Well, I decided, I don't, I don't, I never know. It's like there's just this knowing this, you got to stay with this. And I, I print out and skim like, like probably seven of his articles. Wow. And he's written, he's written hundreds, but it's like the guy's a genius. But one of the most important articles he wrote was in 2004 about the interplay between copper and iron. And he was one of the first people to really document that in an academic and scholarly way. And it's, It'll take your breath away because people, I think there's, there's two great crimes on the planet. First crime is that babies grow dull. That's a real problem. But I think the bigger crime was that in the world of science, they separated copper from iron metabolism and they're not separated. And that's really what the book is about is that they are completely interdependent and what people need to understand is uh, from the, the world of traditional Chinese medicine, copper is called the general and iron is called the foot soldier. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have to be a, a military guy to know there's a difference between a general and a foot soldier. And when the general's not around, foot soldiers go crazy. And that's exactly what happens inside our body. It's amazing. A great explanation. So... Let's discuss the role of copper and iron in the mitochondria. For those who are listening and watching, uh, the, okay. the general understanding of the mitochondria is that it's, it's the battery that you just showed. It's the battery of the cells. It produces energy, ATP. Right. Uh, there's, there's also a, a component to the mitochondria that acts as a surveillance system of the environment. Mm-hmm. So what exactly is uh, the relationship between copper, iron, and, and mitochondrial function? Um. Great question. Where, where to begin, right? So, <laughs> it's like, uh, go for hours, right? <laughs> I, I, would, I would encourage people who, who haven't um, um, a gearhead been, you want to look up the work of Brian Glancy at NIH and Douglas Wallace at uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Well, those are probably two of the most lucid minds. Maybe um, another a third one would be um, Hammerling. Hammerling, brilliant. Uh, he picked. He picked up where Bernard Kaldenbach uh, left off, but um, so the the thing is, we've been trained to think of the mitochondria as a uh, energy furnace. You know, it's just it's just putting out energy. You know, <laughs> well, first of all, let's let's back up. There's a hundred and there's 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 forty quadrillion mitochondria in our body, so that's fifteen zeros. So we, we can't even comprehend that. It's like, mm-hmm. what, what did you say? And so. We all have this image of the, um, from our biology class in high school, we have that biology textbook, we have the picture of the cell and, and then we've got the nucleus, this big giant nucleus in the center and, and all, off in the corner is like two or three mitochondria. Well, I've come to realize that that picture was drawn by Walt Disney, it has no sense of reality to it. And the average cell has about 500 mitochondria and the, and the average liver cell 2,000, kidney cell, 4,000, heart cell, 10,000, mature egg in a woman's body, 600,000 mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And then we've got neurons up here that should have as many as 2 million Mm -hmm. mitochondria. It's like we can't even comprehend that. And And, and, and just just to note, it's the cells that are mostly relied upon for survival that have the most mitochondria the brain the heart well the ovaries like it's, it's like survival is the name of the game right i i like that that's good no that's exactly what it is yeah and so um to understand what's what's also important is this we've got a big number of mitochondria big distribution in different organs survival is key <clears throat> then we find out that each mitochondria is supposed to have 50,000 atoms of copper in the matrix of the mitochondria. And that's the work of Paul Cobine at Auburn University, uh, 2004, 2006. So it's, it's like suddenly where our mind is beginning to like explode with, wait a minute, I've never even heard of this copper thing. And then what, what you've got to do is move away from this idea of mitochondria as a power plant to mitochondria 
as factory. And what does a factory do? Well, a factory uses energy, but it's making things all the time. Whether we're producing washing machines or cars or cell phones or whatever, but the factory that has a completely different mind, mind construct of what it's doing. And that's really what our mitochondria do. These are incredibly sentient beings. Their, their real name is purple bacteria. I think it's pretty cool. Well, why, why are they purple? Well, it turns out, yeah, right? Well, your book, book is purple, huh? <laughs> book is purple. But the, uh, um, it turns out that complex four, which is really where the action is in, in the mitochondria, as you know, uh, cytochrome C oxidase, um, it absorbs red light, but it emits blue light. And when you do that, guess what the color is? It's purple because you mix blue and red. And so <clears throat> that's a really important thing to know is that the absorbing of red light, well, that's that happens with the frequency of copper. It's a really important thing. And the, and the um, the color of complex four, Ben, is the color of your T-shirt. It actually, and, and a friend of mine who's a hunter, he he uh, shot a, a turkey last fall for for Thanksgiving, and he was surprised when he uh, opened up the carcass to discover that the stomach was the color of your T-shirt. Hmm. He said, "Why is it why is it blue?" I said, "Because it's a high energy organ for that bird." And again, it just people don't think about the energy side. And so the, the mantra that I use now uh, in my work, like my coaching, my education, my, my uh, consulting and things is ignore the enemies, ignite the energy. Mm. And what people don't know is that the, the immunometabolism system that we were all spooked about a couple of years ago, it runs on energy and intelligence. Mm -hmm. And there's only one element that, that brings that about. It's, it's copper. And so the, the part that's been completely um, suppressed is that the, again, these metals are connected together around that critical protein ceruloplasmin. Explain and, what that is. Nobody, most people have no idea what that is. Well, it's, it's actually the master antioxidant enzyme. Everyone says, well, I thought glutathione was. Well, yeah, actually glutathione is the master greeter inside the cell, but it's not the antioc master antioxidant. What, 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 what about melatonin? Like what's the relationship? I was just going to say, and melatonin is the master antioxidant in the mitochondria. Got it. But but ceruloplasmin is, and, and the funny thing was, and when I narrated the book about, about six weeks ago, it was like they're in the studio for, 16 hours. I know how that goes. That's a grueling process. It Congratulations. It's, it's, it's Respect. <laughs> and so that, that word <clears throat> appears about a thousand times in the book. And you start to get fatigued with the word. And so I started saying, instead of saying ceruloplasmin, I was saying ceruloplasma, which is what everyone does. And the, and the engineer said, yeah. and the engineer said, you got to say it again. I said, no, it's my book. I can say it any way I want. He goes, no, no, you have to say it the right way. But <clears throat> this, this protein 1,066 amino acids. And people may know of the movie Fury with Brad Pitt about mm -hmm. the tank, you know. Well, that's really what ceruloplasmin is. It's a tank. And instead of having five soldiers inside, it's got eight soldiers. And those are copper atoms. And if you remember in that movie, towards the end, there's a very critical scene when uh, the lone survivor has to get out of the tank. And he sneaks out a trap door at the bottom. Well, there is a trap door in ceruloplasmin. And when it gets oxidized because of too much iron, too much ascorbic acid, too much chemicals that are, are very toxic to this protein, the copper comes out that little trap door like diarrhea. And then what happens is people start playing the copper toxicity card. Oh, I'm copper toxic. Not knowing that, that, that let, let me run through the, the um, mechanics of the body. From yeah, and real quick, what's the name of that door? Oh, it's a tyrosine. I think it's uh, 372. Tyrosine 372 is the actual trap door. Mm -hmm. I could have that number wrong, but it's absolutely a, a tyrosine. tyrosine. Okay. And so this um, protein, when it is fully loaded, 
eight copper atoms, uh, it can express up to 20 different enzyme functions. Now, if you know anything about big pharma, they're one gene, one protein, one function. That's, and they despise ceruloplasmin because it makes a mockery of their arsenal of drugs. And when Holmberg and Laurel discovered it in 1948 and started writing about it, they thought they had discovered the Holy Grail. They were like, this is, this is pretty cool stuff. And there was just this rush to try to destroy it. Mm. And again, I wear a tin hat, folks. They're, when you start to do the research, you start to see things. And I'm, a, I'm really good at pattern recognition. Well, the pattern recognition around the assaults on ceruloplasmin are many and varied. But the, probably the most toxic chemical that's in our regular diet is ascorbic acid. Mm. And Holmberg and Laurel talked about how that denatured ceruloplasm and caused it to lose its copper. So what people don't, because they don't know what ceruloplasmin is, and they don't know what it does, they're like, well, it can't be that important. Well, it doesn't take long to, to get into the research to find out there's an oh my gosh factor to it. And one of its most important enzyme functions is an enzyme called ferrooxidase. Ferro iron. Let me oxidize the iron. And let me turn ferrous iron, which is a very toxic form of iron, into ferric iron, because then it can be loaded into proteins. It can be, uh, iron can be put into the ferritin storage protein inside the cell, or it can be attached to transferrin, which is a transport protein to allow the iron recycling system to work. Now, what's really important in this discussion, because I know what you really want to focus on is the mitochondria, mm -hmm. that's, that's front and center. <clears throat> the terminal destination for iron and oxygen are our mitochondria. And what needs to happen, there are two, two separate uh, events that take place. Iron needs to be recycled. And oxygen needs to be activated and turned into water. Those are two really important events. Well, if, if the mitochondria cannot activate O2 to create 2H2O, it's going to create H2O2 which is hydrogen peroxide. Mm. And H2O2 is another way of spelling inflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation is not a disease. It's a marker for piss poor energy production. And it turns out that, that complex four is a, a two-stroke engine. The downstroke is easy. Let's get oxygen to hydrogen peroxide. But then we got to come up and turn that hydrogen peroxide into two molecules of water. And, and there's some amazing articles out there about how it's done. But if you don't have copper, it's not going to happen. And I think one of the, I just find it entertaining. I, I've been studying this for, I guess I really got into copper about seven or eight years ago. But I've been studying the complex four for a number of years, many years. And I've, st I've stared at it. I've, I've thought about it. I've reflected on it. And it was, just, it was just a few months ago, I was looking at it, and I went, wait a minute, complex four, complex four is a dimer. It, it's, it's a mirror image of itself. It doesn't have three copper atoms, it has six. And it's like, oh my God, it's like, you know, if, if you believe the earth is round, you suddenly think it's flat. If you think it's flat, you suddenly think it's round. It was like this mind-blowing uh, realization that's like, and no one talks about that. Mm. No one talks about the fact that complex four is a dimer. And it's like, wow. And, and so if you don't have copper in your diet, if you don't have retinol to make copper bioavailable, well, then you're, you're not going to be getting very good mitochondria function. And you're not going to be getting good uh, antioxidant enzyme activity. And, and all of this information is it's so central to the copper atom but nobody talks about it. I mean, there are there are literally thousands of articles on iron metabolism that are written, and there's never one mention of the word copper. 
Mm -hmm. It's like it's like talking about a family and saying that, well, let's just talk about the dad. Let's forget about the fact that there's a mom. Wait, where did the kids come from? Well, let's not go into the details. The dad got them at the supermarket. Let's go on with the story. And it's like, come on. They're they're completely um, suppressing that I think it's the most fascinating part of biology is the ability to work with oxygen. And if a if a mitochondria cannot produce energy, it cannot recycle iron. Well, guess what happens? Iron starts to accumulate in the mitochondria. It's going to start in the mitoferrin, and then it's going to start to spill out into the ferritin in the cell. Well, then you, those studies will indicate that as iron accumulates, you can have anywhere from a 40% loss of energy, 60, 80, 94% loss of energy as iron accumulates in the cell. Guess what aging is? Iron accumulation. It's like all the iron biologists know it. It's like they, they, it's so central to their thinking because we add a milligram of iron to our body mm -hmm. every day. So I, the reason why I look older than you, Ben, is I've got more iron. So I, I'm, I'll be 70 this November. So I've got about 25,000 milligrams of iron, and it's very easy to do it. You multiply 70 times 365, and there's a big number that pops out, and we're supposed to have about 5,000 milligrams of iron. You are probably in your 30s, maybe? Yeah, 37. Okay. And so your number is going to be half mine. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's it. And we like, well, it's got to be more complicated than that. And there's, there's a classic uh, study, the nine hallmarks of aging. Well, all nine hallmarks of, are affected by iron accumulation. Hmm. But, so, so fascinating. And then somebody listening or watching probably has to stop it and then just rewind to the beginning <laughs> and then come back here again. <laughs> I'm going to listen to this over and over myself. So you mentioned ferritin, right? Yes. Oh, boy. Like, let's get into <laughs> To ferritin, right? The, the most common understanding of ferritin is that it's stored iron, but you, you mentioned it in several different ways. Could you deep dive into ferritin? If we're getting blood ferritin done, what yeah. is that showing us? <laughs> do your do your listeners have seatbelts? <laughs> <laughs> strap, strap them on right now. They're probably listening yeah. in their car, so they exactly. probably do yeah. have seatbelts. This is a good time to tug on the oxygen, right? <laughs> well, um, there's, there's four different forms of ferritin in the body. <clears throat> and, and there's two principal flavors. There's heavy chain and light chain. And whenever you see the phrase heavy chain, it means copper's involved. Okay. And so uh, what that means is that in order for the two heavy chain uh, forms of ferritin are inside the mitochondria, is mitoferrin, and inside the cell is ferritin heavy chain. And what that means is that the, the protein is able to express the ferrooxidase enzyme, changing the, the valence of iron so it can be loaded safely into the chamber of the protein, into the core. The light, the, the other kind is light chain, there's no ferrooxidase function. And the light chain is expressed most extensively in the liver. The heavy chain is expressed mostly in the heart. So you'll see ferritin H and ferritin L. Well, H can be heavy, heart, L is liver, light. Well, and when, I, when I get my uh, ferritin lab from LabCorp, it doesn't show H or L, it just says total ferritin. Oh, I know. I know. We haven't gotten to that one. Okay, got that's, it. That's the fourth kind of ferritin. And that's called serum ferritin. So this this is um, one of my favorite commentators was Paul Harvey. Now you know the rest of the story. So we've just gone through two forms of heavy chain, one form of light chain, and then we get to serum ferritin. And we've been trained like circus bears to believe that the ferritin in the blood is an accurate reflection of what's happening inside the cell. Mm -hmm. And I've actually trained Amish farmers to understand this, so they really get it. So I say, say to these farmers, I say, if you want to know how many bales of hay you have in your barn inside your cell, would you go out in the field and start to count it? 
And they go, no. Well, the field is the blood. It's not the barn. Sorry to disappoint, but there's no relationship between bales of hay in the field and bales of hay in the, in the barn. And it turns out that it was in 1928 when a team of scientists at University of Wisconsin figured out that when you suppress copper in an animal's diet, iron is going to ramp up in the liver. 1928. And then January of last year, um, <clears throat> Kim and Gonzalez did a very important study to update that 1928 study. They looked at it genetically, and they looked at four iron genes, four zinc genes, four, four copper genes, and five zinc genes. And they, they want to say, we don't know what's going to happen. Let's just see what, how, does, how do these genes change in the state of copper deficiency? And only one, only one gene upregulated, ferritin light chain, hmm. which means that that is the gene that fires up to allow the iron to accumulate in the liver, which totally changes the physiology of the human being. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that don't know this, you're eating a copper deficient diet. You are the, you are the two-legged rat in the experiment called American survival. Right. And so <clears throat> liver's building, it's not just building in your liver, or excuse me, iron's building, not just in your liver, it's building in your mitochondria, mm -hmm. all over, all over your body. And so Here's the, here's the nitty gritty, and this is like, as you say, people are going to have to rewind, go back. They're going to probably have to read this or review this three or four times. Arosio, 1983, Warwood, about the same time, I think it's 83 or 84, and Kell and Pretorius, 2014. Three different teams came to the same conclusion that under stress, the body needs to get to iron. And so it sends the ferritin protein into the stomach of the cell called ly the lysosome. Mm -hmm. What people don't know is that what runs the lysosome are high energy peroxides. Where does the high energy come from? Ding, ding, ding. And if you don't have the ding, 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 you can't break down the protein. And, and so what a low copper organism does is it dumps iron into the lysosome to create something called lipofusin. People have heard that term. Iron gets dumped into the lysosome. 10 amino acids get cleaved off the light chain protein, and it becomes secreted into the bloodstream, and it's called serum ferritin. And I had occasion to talk to Dr. Kell about this very issue. Oh, cool. Very, very, very affable guy. Incredible. He's about my age. Wall of books. He's at the University of Manchester. Brilliant. In his signature article called Iron Behaving Badly, uh, which only has 2,400 footnotes. Um, 2009. A wonderful article. And um, I said, Dr. Kell, I'm just curious. What's the ideal serum ferritin for a human? And he said, zero. I said, what? <laughs> I said, no, you, you, no, 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 you didn't understand the question. He said, no, I understood the question. It should be zero. He said, more like, I want to make sure you understand this. He said, rising ferritin in the blood is not a sign of iron vitality. It's a sign of organ pathophysiology. Do you understand what I just said? I said, yes, sir, I did. And people have been trained like circus bears to think that, oh, I need serum ferritin up between uh, 80 and 100. Basically, what you're doing is you are toxifying your liver to get serum ferritin that high. And here's the kicker. This is going to blow your, your listeners' minds. Most thyroid meds don't work until ferritin gets up into the 80s. Let's well, think about this. So that they want to create liver pathology to make my thyroid function work. People have no idea what's going on. Hmm. And again, it's, it's a complete distortion of, of the narrative, but Mother Nature, she knows exactly what's going on. And, and the part that people just don't know, 
or have not been taught. And I really appreciate the chance to have this conversation. And you're a very courageous guy to, you know, Martha's amazing, but it's like, yeah. did you get, did you understand what you were getting into? <laughs> but, but the thing is people don't realize that every facet of iron metabolism is copper dependent. When did they know for a fact that you cannot make hemoglobin without copper? 1932, hmm. LVM and Sherman, University of Wisconsin, same institution where they figured out about the, the rising iron in the liver. 1932, so that was only 90 years ago. And when is it, when was it taught in medical school? Never. Never. Yeah. And so that, see people, I think in this, in this post, you know, what era, um, people I think can be more open to the fact, wow, they got away with that. Wow, they, they completely, they completely cr crafted a narrative that has nothing to do with Mother Nature. And that's what people need to kind of step back from what they know. It's a famous um, saying by uh, Mark Twain. It's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that just ain't so. That's right. And there's so much misinformation and disinformation in the uh, literature about especially iron and anemia. Yeah. And, and the phrase that I use is we've been misled and we've been misfed. Mm -hmm. And so the I, I take the stance, Ben, there is no anemia of iron deficiency on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is physiologically and physically impossible. Why? Well, what's the number one element on planet Earth? It's iron. And prior to March of 2020, I would have argued that humans were the most evolved species on the planet. Now it's kind of questionable. And and basically what we've been engaged in the last two years is an IQ test, and not yeah. everyone's passing. Yeah. And so the thing is, um, if, you, if you are labeled anemic, you're anemic, that what that tells you is that you're the most evolved species and you cannot metabolize the number one element on the planet, which makes no sense. And what's missing? Ding, ding, ding. And copper. so you, you're pointing to copper for those who are listening. Well, yeah. I, I want to pause you right there because, okay. All right. Um, I agree. I'm not getting excited talking about this. Right? Yeah, no, I know. I, I don't blame you. So <laughs> I, I always say, you know, look at what mainstream news is promoting in regards to health and nutrition. Look at the government guidelines in regards to health and go, nutrition. Go the yeah, other and way. do the complete opposite. Right. You're going to land in the right direction, which is to your point, because Alvin Toffler also said, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who could who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and then relearn. So that's exactly it. Right. I, I want to understand more about the anema, uh, anemia. Anemia. So you just said, and I have it in my notes too. Anemia does not exist on this planet. Right. Anemia means not in the blood. Is right. what you said. Right. If it's not in the blood, where is it? And your answer is it's in the tissues. Exactly. And the reason that it's in the tissues is because we don't have enough copper. Exactly. See, the, the thing that there are three in a traditional iron blood test, there's three buckets of iron that they can study. They study hemoglobin, they can study serum iron, mm -hmm. and they can study serum ferritin. So I think we've, what's important for people to know that 70% that of the iron in the body is in hemoglobin. So allegedly, we're supposed to have 5,000 milligrams of iron, 100 milligrams of copper. Let's go into the, from the body to the blood. In the blood, there's 3,500 milligrams of iron, one milligram of copper in the blood. And then let's go down another notch. And let's go into the bone marrow. And there's a, there's a recycling system for iron called the reticuloendothelial system. And what's important for the listeners to understand is that every second of every day, we need to make 2.5 million red blood cells every second. So we've been talking for about 30 minutes now, times 60, times 2.5 million. In the course of 24 hours, we make 2 trillion red blood cells. Now, what's amazing, those are big numbers, but it only takes 24 milligrams of iron to support that level of, of uh, production. So in the bone marrow, 24 milligrams of iron, 47 
milligrams of copper. So we went from 50 to 1, 3,500 to 1, to 24 to 47. It's like, wow. And so that's important to understand that in a blood test, hemoglobin, 70% of the um, iron is going to show up there. And from 1860 to 1972, every clinician knew that was the biggest bucket of iron, and it was always recycling. 1972, Jacobs et al., famous team of uh, hematologists in London, said, no, let's move the spotlight to the ferritin, not telling people that there's four different kinds, not telling people that the serum is completely distortion of reality. I've actually renamed it ferritin because more mistakes are made with measuring ferritin than any other facet of um, blood testing. And well, so you your ferritin should be zero. I know why. Well, that's what Kel said. I said, Dr. Kel, I, I, I'm focused on 20. I, I even, I even spotted up to 50, but, but we can get into an hour long discussion about, about okay. that. But the thing is, um, ferritin, when it's inside the cell, not in the blood, but in the, in the cell, it represents about 10% of the iron in the body. And then 4% is in this thing called serum iron. Well, what does that mean? Well, it turns out that when you draw a, a, a vial of blood, it's red, right? And then you spin it down in a centrifuge and you get two colors. You get red in the bottom, packed red blood cells, they're all squished together. And the top part is kind of this clear yellowish fluid, and that's called serum. But let's spell it differently. S-E-A-R-U-M. Serum. Ser it's actually seawater. It's supposed to be it's supposed to have the mineral composition of seawater. So the red blood cells are actually swimming in seawater, right? And there's iron in that seawater that's part of this recycling program that happens all day long, 24 hours a day. And, and that iron is supposed to be attached to a protein called transferrin. And that's the transport protein for iron from wherever it was used to get it back to the bone marrow so it can be made into new red blood cells. Well, it turns out that in order to get iron out of the tissue, and attached to the transferrin, it requires ceruloplasmin. And when ceruloplasmin is present, the movement of iron out of the cell and onto the transferrin is only two and a half times faster. It's like, like that. But in the absence of that, when you slow down iron, that's when you start to create problems. Hmm. And that, and, and the the movement of electrons through copper is three times faster than the movement of electrons through iron. Did you know that when they first came out with the telegraph, they used iron wire? Mm, interesting. I didn't know then that. They, then they discovered that, wait, wait a minute, there's something even faster. And, and I guess if you get really fussy about it, platinum is the fastest. Gold would be second fastest. Gold is third. Well, platinums are also very expensive. Yeah, so they yeah. picked pick the, the, the best ratio they could get of availability and cost. But the thing is, when we're dealing with um, buildings, we know what allows a building to be tall and strong, right? Mm -hmm. It's iron, right? Mm -hmm. But what's the metal that allows a, a tall, strong building to move? What's copper? Copper, right. Because it's allowing the utilities, water and electricity to move in that building. And guess what? our body works the exact same way. And we have an electrical grid. We know we have a central nervous system. We have a peripheral nervous system. Well, there's fascia from head to toe. Mm -hmm. That fascia, all of that connective tissue is made by one enzyme. It's called lysyl, L-Y-S-Y-L, oxidase. And lysyl oxidase is what allows elastin to connect with collagen. And together, they bring integrity to tissue because it has strength and flexibility. And anyone who has EDS has a lack of lysyl oxidase because they have a lack of copper. What's EDS? Uh, Ehrlos Daniels syndrome. Okay. Connective, dis uh, connective tissue disorders. Okay. People are hypermobile. Mm -hmm. And so, again, 
these fundamentals are not taught in doctor school. Right. And that that's where the real breakdown takes place. So I want to get in, we're going to transition into, because I know the solution isn't as easy as just copper enrich all the foods like they've been with iron. So I want to get into some of the solutions and some of the things that have been depleting copper, but a question specifically regarding how mitochondria deal with, reactive oxygen species, right? We know when, when mitochondria produces energy, right. high demand, it creates free radicals, and there's an uncoupling that occurs by the mitochondria. Ketones, ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. keto lifestyle, ketones act as a signaling molecule to help mm -hmm. the mitochondria create more of themselves, to uncouple, to help with free radicals. That's why a lot of studies show a ketogenic diet could extend lifespan or lower free radicals. But what relationship does minerals and copper play into this process of uncoupling and lowering inflammation? Great question. Uh, <clears throat> again, these, these energy factories, um, <clears throat> they have different kinds of fuel they can burn. And you're talking about keto. And so if you ferment sugar without oxygen, you get two units of energy. If you oxidize the sugar, you're going to get around 34 to 38. But if you oxidize fat, <clears throat> you're going to get 140. Um, yep units of, of energy. That's great. So 90% <clears throat> of the energy comes out of the mitochondria. 90% of the reactive oxygen species come out of the same mitochondria. Mm -hmm. It's a it's the price of admission. We drive cars that have all sorts of energy, but they also put out exhaust. Mm -hmm. And what, what is important for people to understand is that it, it does not take a lot of copper to run our body. Again, think about 5,000 milligrams of iron, but it's only 100 milligrams of copper. Again, generals and foot soldiers. But, but the uh, intelligence of that copper is legendary, and its sway in the body is amazing. And so the important thing to understand is that copper is creating the energy it's, it's instrumental in the electron transport chain. Again, the, the purists would tell you, well, copper is only in complex four. Actually, that's not true. It's in complex one. In the plant world, it's in complex three. In all, uh, in all life forms, it's in complex four. And there's absolute certainty that it's in complex five, which is ATP synthase. Mm. So you've got the electron transport chain basically run by copper. Then when it hooks up with complex five, then it becomes what's called oxidative phosphorylation. But there's a, a widget in the, in the middle that you're alluding to, the uncoupling protein. And when why does that get activated? When there's too much oxidative stress. When the ability to make energy is exceeded by the production of reactive oxygen species. When the, when the mitochondria cannot properly and efficiently change oxygen into water, because that's, that's what the mitochondria are. They're water wheels. And when those water wheels can't produce enough energy, they become what I call ferrous wheels, play on words, F-E-R-R-O-U-S, and that's where all of the symptoms come from, from, from that shift from energy, water wheel, to rust. As soon as rust starts being made, and you've created all sorts of metabolic dysfunction. And the some would tell you, oh, that's a good thing to uncouple so we don't create so much oxidative stress. No, that's not a good thing. <laughs> you want if you're gonna have a keto diet, you better have a really healthy supply of copper because the the metabolism of fats is copper dependent. And the and the trick is you cannot. You cannot um, absorb, you cannot digest copper in your diet if you don't have fat in your diet. And you cannot metabolize fats if you don't have copper in your tissue. Mm -hmm. Now, I've read, I've read a lot of articles, thousands and thousands of articles. Ben, how many do you think have actually talked about the importance of fat metabolism in the mitochondria? I don't know, three? <laughs> one, one, <laughs> one. It's absolutely amazing. And so I would argue that this, these purple bacteria are fat-burning machines. They were designed to burn fat, and they've been turned into sugar factories mm. in the modern era. 
And what you need to understand, the work of, uh, last name is Charlie, C-H-A-R-L-E-Y, 1963, did pioneering work about the iron chelating ability of sugar. And they knew when they were adding, back, <clears throat> back in the day, I was born in 1952, you were a twinkling in the, in the, in the heavens. But um, when I was three years old, before I was three years old, uh, Eisenhower has a heart attack. As the first of eight heart attacks, yeah, September twenty fourth, nineteen fifty five. It's like I was there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, the, the thing is, when he had his heart attack, Ansel Keys flexes his muscles and said, "Let's get cholesterol out of the diet." Everybody knows that, right? Well, the, here's the part that everyone missed: when he took cholesterol out of the diet, guess what he was removing? Retinol. That was the target all along. Ret get retinol out, because what does retinol do? It makes copper bioavailable so we can make more energy so we can deal with the exhaust. Yeah. And that's the part that everyone missed in terms of what Keyes was trying to do. And, and what was also missed is that everyone focused on the cholesterol and that that was creating the plaque. No, it was the lipid peroxidation of the cholesterol because there was rising iron. Why was there rising iron? Because in 1941, they started adding iron filings mm -hmm. to the food system. And then they increased it 50% in 1969. And so then what did they do in, on top of that? When they started to take all of the fat out of the diet, what did they have to replace it with? Sugar. Mm -hmm. And then what did sugar do? It became an iron magnet. And then we began to, people don't realize how much iron we have in our body because of this uh, supernatural fortification of the food system, the hybridization of foods now that have a, a bias to taking up iron. When I was a little kid, we would eat spinach. Back in the 50s, guess what, guess what you got in spinach? You got copper. Now, go to a nutrient table. Copper's not even in the mix. Mm -hmm. It's now taking up iron. The food system has been radically changed to turn us into iron beings. People don't understand that. They don't, yeah. realize, they don't realize what 2020 really represented was a rather watershed event. To basically, well, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to get into what it means, but I just, just know that there was a big shift that took place. We'll leave it at that. I, yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. I hear that. Uh, some people are not ready to hear that. So uh, a qu clar clarifying question, right? If ketones, if burning fat instead of sugar is beneficial and, and, right. and there's value in ketones being used, yeah. not, not right. all the time, long term, but there's value in it. Right. Ketones, don't ketones help the mitochondria uncouple? And you're saying mitochondria uncoupling is not a good thing, but sh can there be a beneficial or let me rephrase this. Can there be a short term benefit to mitochondria yes. uncoupling, but long term, it's not a good idea. Is that exactly. what you really That's were saying? That's a very good clarification. Thank you. I think that's exactly that's what you meant. Right. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you 100 percent because it's the chronic, it's the chronic uncoupling that okay. is so damaging. Yeah. Because short term, I mean, it's um, it's like a hormetic stress, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it could create stronger, more robust mitochondria, but then long term, which is one of the reasons why I don't agree with long term ketosis or excessive fasting. It's because you're going to chronically uncouple and it's going to lead to more problems. So I'm glad that you clarified that. Well, I'm uh, glad you pointed it out. Thank yeah, because uh, I wanted to make sure about that. So you, you talk about it in the book, very fascinating, right? Because we're going to get to the solution for those watching and listening. They're like, All right, but what do I take? What is the solution? We'll get to that shortly as we recap. But, you know, you mentioned ascorbic acid, which is the synthetic <laughs> version of vitamin C. It's everywhere. A right. lot of people are even taking it now because the last two years, take your vitamin C and they're really taking ascorbic acid. It's in catch up and all these products. Uh, explain again why that's uh, something we want to avoid and not take in our diet or supplements. Right. Um, the, the hallmark of my work is to identify, and this is an intuitive process, but identify people who I think are telling the truth and that I trust. And so when I read about Holmberg and Laurel discovering this protein in, in 48, I'm like, well, they were pretty smart to do that. So yeah. when they start talking about ascorbic acid is not good, I, I take a deep bunny, bunny trail to see what, what's that all about and then come up with 15 different studies that say they were right. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, um, ascorbic acid is not the whole food vitamin C complex. Vitamin C complex is like the car we drive. 
There's an engine, steering wheel, four wheels, and a cover. That's, that's the vitamin C molecule. It's got all sorts of moving parts and a cover. The cover, okay. So what, what's ascorbic acid? It's the cover of the car and no moving parts. That's a good thing to know. Ascorbic acid is a pro-oxidant. Vitamin C molecule complex is an antioxidant. It's in the literature, folks. And, and there, are, there are practitioners out there that go crazy when I start talking about this. And they get very defensive about it, but they don't know the literature. And they don't know what ascorbic acid does inside our body. And it's very important to know this. Um, ascorbic acid blocks the absorption of copper. Hmm, that's good to know. Ascorbic acid blows up the ceruloplasmin protein. Oh, the master antioxidant protein in our blood and in our tissue. Well, that's not, that doesn't sound good. That's not good. Yeah. Ascorbic acid increases. It drives iron deeper into the tissue so it doesn't show up in the blood. And th that's, a, that's a good place. Th those are three good places to start to say, wow. Well, well, yeah, what else does it do? Oh, it increases the production of hydrogen peroxide. So that means it's affecting the mitochondria. And so hydrogen peroxide is a signaling molecule. We know that. But again, it's it's hormetic, right? You know, it's the bookends that'll kill you. And why do they use it in oncology? Oh, I I you know I took a, a, a vitamin ox, ascorbic acid a IV and I was cured. And like, no, what they did was they poisoned your cells with hydrogen peroxide, and you didn't know that. And the whole thing, don't get me started on, on cancer, but there is no cancer. There's no disease. It's cancer metabolism. Mm -hmm. and, and so what's the classic sign of, of cancer? Warburg effect. Mm -hmm. Oxygen's present, but, but, the, but the cell cannot oxidize the substrate. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's no copper. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. bio copper. So the, the thing is that people have been uh, misled and misfed, as I say, they were taking ascorbic acid, vitamin D, and zinc. What's important for people to know, and again, you can read about it in the book. It's in the book. There's a lot of literature cited in the book. Those three working together destroy the bioavailability of copper. Oh, and what happens when you destroy the bioavailability of copper? Iron rises in the tissue. Well, that not that what I want? No, that's not what you want because it increases... What's it going to do? It's going to affect mitochondrial function. It's going to affect energy production. It's going to affect your immune system. It's going to create so much oxidative stress. And you would think that this would be taught in doctor school, right? No, no, it's not. We know it won't. So ascorbic acid, vitamin C, synthetic version of vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. That's like the COVID cocktail right there. My, right. my, my colleague, um, Dr. Joel Rosen, who, who he, oh, yeah. He, yeah, he's my friend. He, we spoke at uh, Las Vegas a few weeks ago. He was talking about this on stage and he, he even had a PowerPoint slide with your book and your work. Oh, God, that's your great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if not ascorbic acid, then the solution is a real vitamin C complex, maybe like Camu Camu, but make sure it's real vitamin C. Exactly. For, for vitamin D, what's the solution for that if we want to take it in supplemental form? Uh, sunlight is amazing. <laughs> right, sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mushrooms, eggs, yeah. salmon. But right. what about, is there... Get it Get it from your diet. Do not get it from a bottle. Please don't get it from a bottle. There's no <laughs> there's no supplement of vitamin D that you, even if they balance out A, D, E, and K. I'll, I'll tell you what, Ben. What we should do is have um, a whole conversation on the stops. Because the stop. there, there, there are stops and starts in the RCP. Oh, got it, got it. Root cause, yeah. root cause protocols or CP. Right. Got and it, I, think, I think it would be really good for your listeners to understand the rationale for the stops. And I'll just cut to the chase. In my humble opinion, folks, vitamin D supplements are poison to our metabolism. And what they cause is vitamin A deficiency. Now, what you aren't aware of is the research of Dr. Burroughs, who is working at Rockefeller Institute, I'll let you connect the dots on that. Yeah, got it. 1925 and four publications in 1926 where he perfected retinol deficiency to create cancer. Mm -hmm. That's a very important thing to know. Yeah, so I agree with you. And I've seen research that shows when you take vitamin D 
uh, in excess, it creates a functional deficiency in A, E, and K, uh, A, E, and K, right? Because right. you need to have them together. That they're, they're, The receptor sites are, are very similar. Right. So, so getting it from food is best. Sunshine is best. I agree with you. But there are some companies out there mm-hmm. that do formulate a fat-soluble vitamin complex. And you're saying even though they put it in the right ratios, you still wouldn't recommend taking that in supplement form is what you are saying. What I think is important is the work of uh, Stephanie Seneff. Right. Uh, vitamin, D. Researcher. Yeah. vitamin D is supposed to be sulfate. It's not supposed to be fat. It's supposed to be liquid, water-soluble. And, and people blow past that all the time. Again, I think Mother Nature understands this. The part, oh, of the cha- part of the challenge, Ben, is people have been trained to think that they are vitamin D deficient, and that's just a bait and switch. That's a, they've fabricated a condition that does not exist. Vitamin D deficiency is a sign of inflammation, but it isn't a lack of vitamin D that causes it. You can, you can take a bucket full of vitamin D, and you will not correct deficient. I agree. I agree. And insulin actually blocks the conversion of vitamin. The first step in the conversion of vitamin D to get produced, insulin blocks it. So that's a part of inflammation there. So right. That makes total sense to me. Um, okay. Zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, we know that's an issue. You also said that, um, going to my notes here, hormone replacement therapy changes the bioavailability of copper in the body, which mm-hmm. changes your ability to produce energy. I share a little bit more about that. Well, no, the thing is, <clears throat> what, what's important for people to understand is where do these hormones come from? Well, they, they come from enzymes. Mm-hmm. What activates the enzymes? Minerals. But why, why are the hormones being produced? Because they're responding to oxygen status in the body. Let's take the, let's take the granddaddy hormone of all, T3. Everyone loves T3, right? I got news for you guys. It, the, the thyroid does not run the body. The thyroid responds to the body. Mm-hmm. And, and what is T3? It's an oxygen sensor. Where does it hang out? Complex four. What's it sniffing? It's sniffing to see what kind of oxidative stress there is. And what are hormones? They're signaling molecules. Mm-hmm. And what does T3 do? It When the oxidative stress starts to build up, it signals the liver, ding, 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 and says, hey, we need more of that ceruloplasmin thingy. We need more copper in the, in the mitochondria. And that's the work of Jens Mytag, 2012, a European endocrinologist who I think runs circles around most endocriminologists in this country. <laughs> that's good. Uh, okay, fascinating. All right. And then let's talk about some of the solutions. Well, we also know like herbicides, pesticides, speaking of Dr. Um, uh, not Dr. But Stephanie sent up's work. They um, yeah, sure. chelate copper out of the, out of the, the body and minerals. So on your website, which is uh, repeat the website again, I don't have it here in my notes. RCP one, two, three dot org RCP for root cause protocol. One, two, three dot org rcp123.org. It's like we're wrapping here. That's so right. on your website uh, for your books on there, but you also have uh, information about your protocol, the root cause protocol. And then you talk about different supplements that you recommend to get this back in balance. So maybe if you could share a few of the things we could start incorporating, we understand what we should remove, but what can we bring back into the diet now? Yeah. Yeah. And again, just to emphasize the stops are really important. Yeah. People- People can't imagine what, what they're doing to themselves. But the starts, really the, the whole basis of the RCP is to lower the iron footprint in our body and increase the copper footprint. And it isn't really complicated. You've got make sure you've got a good mineral base in your water and in the food that you're eating. And that, that implies a different kind of food requires more real food you know, organically grown, what have you. I think you all know that. Uh, it implies more fat. I mean, I think that the, the uh, Weston A. Price diet is a pretty safe place to start. You know, that's a, a good place to start anyway. But the, the whole premise is we need more copper, especially in our diet. Three great sources is um, bee pollen, mm-hmm. again, organically grown, uh, real vitamin C, which we talked about. Yep. And... Uh, but our preferences is grass-fed beef liver. And what most people don't know is that um, there's a lot more 
uh, real vitamin C, and there's a lot more beta carotene in grass than in oranges and carrots. People didn't, I, I didn't know, it's like 14 times more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. And animals are designed to, to burn that. That's, that's their preference. So what's, what's inside the, the vitamin C? That We forgot to talk about this, Ben. Mm -hmm. And what the engine inside the vitamin C molecule is an enzyme called tyrosinase. And the tyrosinase enzyme has two copper atoms at its core. Those two copper atoms are immensely important, particularly uh, when it comes to the thyroid. But we won't get into that right now. But the thing is, uh, you want to have good sources of um, grass-fed beef liver. A lot of people like the desiccated, which I think is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, out of frustration for what happened from 2020 to, to the present day, I created a product called Recuperate. People can look that up. And that's just desiccated beef liver, spirulina, uh, some turmeric, and copper bisglycinate. Just trying okay. to make sure people get the, the actual nutrient that they need. I'm a huge fan of magnesium. Mm -hmm. I think in order to deal with stress, you've got to have more magnesium in your diet. You have a, a group, a Facebook group all about that, right? Exactly. The magnesium yeah. advocacy group. Yep. And so it just, it's the chill pill. I mean, it's it, Emily Deans has coined that. I think it's a great phrase. And so um, I think it's important for people to realize that the stress of your world, this is a really important point. When you have stress in your world, you have oxidative stress in your body. Yeah. Abs absolutely axiomatic. It happens like that. Yeah. And so you got to be able to manage that stress. First, try to get away from it or, or change it or in any way modify it. But the magnesium burn rate that's associated with stress is relentless. Mm -hmm. And when does stress stop? When we're six feet under. We're always going to have stress in our lives. Yeah. And, and how do we deal with stress? By making energy. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you can't make energy without magnesium and copper. That, that's what the mitochondria runs on. And so it's, it's important to have the, the fundamentals Boron is very important. Uh, diatomaceous earth plays a role in helping to uh, deal with parasites. That's a, that's a whole other subject to discuss. Um, also uh, helps with uh, bioavailable testosterone. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so the, the thing is, the um, we've chosen about a dozen different substances as the starts, but we phase them in just to ease it for people to, to adapt this different lifestyle. And this is not a, this is not a uh, diet. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, and that's, that's the way. So you, can, so, so you can deal with your stress. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah and your book outline, we, you know, we just scratched the surface. The book covers uh, a lot of it and then your, your programs cover even more. So where can they go get the book Morley? Um, um, just any online uh, bookseller, uh, Amazon, obviously Abe, Book Barnes and Noble, uh, <clears throat> and they're going to have the ebook as well, and then they're now going to have the audio uh, version as well through Audible, and there are about a dozen different uh, vendors for the audio book. When is the audio book out? It's out now. It's oh, out. nice, good job. All, yeah, all, all, all platforms are available. Great. We'll we'll put links down below in the notes, and then I, I remember you sharing about testing, right? Um, do you still recommend that website requestthetest.com and to get the um? Mm -hmm. What was it? What is it called? The full Mon full Monty Iron Panel. Full Monty uh, Iron Palette and Panel. It, and what we're looking at is the different markers for iron, for zinc, for magnesium inside the red blood cell, uh, copper, ceruloplasmin, and then we look at vitamin A and vitamin D, and we look at the key ratios. There's some very important ratios in there. The ratio of copper to ceruloplasmin is critically important. It should be 3.33. That's the work of uh, Scheinberg and uh, another not, another individual I can't think of from 1960, legendary observation. And then we look at the ratio of A to D, and it should be about 3 to 1 as well. And so um, if, if your vitamin D is above 21, you don't understand how your body works. And if your retinol is below 65, you need more retinol in your diet. If your vitamin D is above 21, you don't understand how your body works. Could you explain that? <laughs> um, you need to go into what well, you just need to read chapter eight, I think it is. But um, the, I'm originally from Baltimore. My nickname is Baltimore Lee. And I, I worship at the altar of Hopkins. 
-hmm. And uh, Mohammed Amer did a very important study in 2013 on the uh, all-cause mortality and vitamin D status. Mm -hmm. And what he was able to prove is there's no clinical benefit to having storage D above 21. Uh, Dr. Dang at NIH has a wonderful study from 2013 where he explains the eight different enzymes that require magnesium to regulate uh, vitamin D. People don't know about that. And then probably the most important study to read is by Meg Mangan, M-A-N-G-I-N, 2014, uh, where she talks about what low vitamin D really means, and it just means inflammation. And what causes inflammation? Lack of copper. Lack of copper. So <laughs> I get I get that. So the, so if somebody has a 22 vitamin D, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem is what you're saying? If there are other... That's exactly right. So uh, Michael Hollick created a farcical land of 30 to 100 with that range. It is, it is such a, an insult to our intelligence and our integrity. It's frightening. So what if somebody has a vitamin C of 65? Can they, and then they have the, all the other, they have retinol is a good ratio. Nice. <laughs> Your, if their vitamin D is 65, their vitamin A has to be three times that. You, there's no vitamin A above 80. So that's impossible. And that saying. ratio, that ratio is critically important for signaling in the body. Three to one, you said vitamin D to vitamin A? Vitamin A to D. Three 2D. times more A than D. And for people who want to dig a little deeper, look up Mawson, M-A-W-S-O-N, 2013, or Conaway, 2013. These are, these are studies that have, have been looking at the two together. What's missing in the world conversation is retinol. And now we're supposed to believe it causes toxicity. And it's like, time out. Let's talk about how the body really works. All right. We've got a lot more to cover. <laughs> so we got <laughs> up too. Um, yeah. We got, we got the hors d'oeuvres out of the way. Now we can we get got to the, the hors d'oeuvres, yeah. you know. Right non-gmo hors d'oeuvres organic grass yeah, yeah. finish and, um, and your listeners can decide whether to vote me off the island that's fine I, 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 I think they're welcome to do that if they well want. i think i think if somebody disagrees with you they should go just fact check all of the all the references you right. gave right that's i'm right. going to look at a lot of them as well and then go get your book uh your book is awesome we'll put yeah. a link for it down below as long as well as well as your website which is uh, our uh, cp123.org uh, anywhere else you want to send them to, Morley? Yeah, the Facebook uh, group, Magnesium Advocacy Group. You're still uh, giving away your phone number and email? Absolutely. I'm getting, <laughs> we're getting there, man. Uh, there's, a, our, there's a root cause protocol page. There's an RCP community. Awesome. There's, a, there's an RCP institute to do the training, 16-week training. And then for the, for the diehards, by all means, uh, my first and last name, Morley Robbins, at Gmail. And my phone number, 847 nine two two eight zero six one and the best part of my week is the one or two people who call me every week and when i answer they go oh my god you actually answered <laughs> that's cool and yeah they, they go into this immediate state of hypoxia and i try to bring it back down yeah <laughs> so keto campers go you know give morley a call he just gave exactly you and his email yeah. and his email in case you want to email him that's right uh, Morley, thanks for your dedication to uh, understand, researching copper, the human body, the mitochondria, your book, and just the work that you're doing. I'm grateful for this conversation. Uh, and I'm, we'll do a round two later this year. We'll talk. We'll dive forward, deep uh, even more into what we spoke about today. And I'm sure there'll be questions, so we'll have a chance to do a Q&A around that as well. Awesome. That sounds okay. good, Morley. Thank you so much for uh, mm -hmm. coming on the show today. Thank you very much for the opportunity.